Anderson. So for the candidates, we already did all of the, uh, the talk to everybody so they know how to come up and ask their questions. Just for a quick recap for you, they'll come up to the microphone here, they'll ask their question and they'll go sit down. Uh, we've encouraged them to get straight to the question and not have a long preamble to their question. If you need more information, please ask. There's two microphones here. Um, if you would like to answer a question, the questions are going to be directed to anyone. There's no, they're not going to be directed to any one person. If you would like to answer a question, just give me a little wave and I'll acknowledge you and then pick up a mic. If someone's speaking and you would like to get in on the conversation, just give me a little wave and I'll put your name and we're just going to go in order. And so there's no specific order, it's very casual, it's very easy going, feel free to talk to each other, feel free to ask for more information and more clarification. Okay. So who, who are we waiting for? We're waiting for Brian? Brian. And Terry. And Terry. Ooh. Okay, well we did, I didn't know that Terry is not planning to come until at least 8 o'clock, so he knew that we would be starting without him. And Brian is still down there? All right. Well, we're 45 minutes late, so let's get on with things. Okay? So, thank you. Oh, and here's Les. Hurry up, Les. Come on. We're going to start without you. Hurry, hurry. So, uh, thank you, Port Hope, for your patience tonight. Um, I know we, we've all waited a while, but it is for a good cause because the candidates did need to go to this other meeting. And uh, I'll ask that when people are asking their questions and when the candidates are answering their questions that um, you keep your, your conversation amongst yourselves to a minimum so that everyone can hear what's being said. And we'll get going with question number one. Good evening, everyone. Um, I guess I'm not used to a mic, so I usually don't need a mic. My lungs are in pretty good shape. My question to all the candidates is, without using the word process, or the idea of both sides sitting at a round table, what location, please be specific, in Port Hope in the downtown core would be your ideal location to build a new building to house the 160 LTC beds from Hope Street Terrace and Regency Manor. Okay. <laughs> does, anybody, does anyone less grab a mic? Yeah, yeah. Less and then uh, Bob. Or we could do a duet. <laughs> <laughs> and, the, and the mics do reach to your seats. So you're on the stage. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Sorry, I'm going to have to sit down. Um, Process round table, round table process. Okay, no. There's two sites. 65 Ward Street is the preferred site right now because there is no other site that's on the map. And if I was blue skying, um, the only other site that would be reasonable would be behind the hospital on Rose Clinton, off of uh, Wellington, behind that where Al LeBlanc has built it. Those would be two preferable sites to me. Um, the, there are alternate sites. Um, the current uh, acreage is about three acres, and primary and, and the objective would be four. Um, Pemberton Road is going to go through to Henderson. And when that happens, it's going to create a four acre lot on the south side, currently uh, owned by Maple Lodge Farms. I think it would be an ideal location. There's a couple of others as well. Further up on Ward Street, um, there is some property uh, owned by the Phillips where the um, Empire Crossings is as well. There's two or three other places that have potential. The issue will be zoning, right? to make sure there's also one uh, that is actually zoned um, near where the uh, Mason homes are being built. So I just am saying clearly, I think there are options for other locations they're essentially uh, located all those places you mentioned? Yes, okay. yes. Within the community and ideally. Okay. Now the other part of that is that Selfridge does have to come to the table and have a talk about looking at those alternatives and working in the municipality. And I would like to see the election campaigning on behalf of Selfridge stop 
I would like to see it progress. It's going to happen. The election's going to happen. There will be a new council, right? And at that point in time, at this, at this juncture, the process with the uh, review board will not finish until February. That gives us, I think, adequate timing to sit down properly you know, and, and look at alternatives. The alternative could be in the end. It stays where it is, and it could happen that the uh, old hospital does get demolished. To me, that would be the last choice I would have. There's also the option to change designs. So there are, and you're trying to be very specific, where are locations? I think we have three or four, uh, two that are, uh, I think could be zoned quite easily, and two or three that would probably need negotiation. So the bottom line is there are alternatives. And then it leads into, so what do you do with where it is and all that kind of stuff. And I think Tony made some good comments the other night uh, regarding how disruptive doing it there will be for the residents also. This is a two and a half year project. I, I know you can shake your head and say it won't be. All of us have lived around construction, you know, and when it's in your backyard or in your house and you live in it, it it's a personal take on it. So you know, to me, I, I think we can solve this and, and, and really, I'm driving for a win-win across the board. So. I would have to say, that's the best thing I've heard in months. <laughs> talking from behind me. If you would like to speak and you'd like to answer this question, please give me a little wave. I'll put your name on the list, okay? Um, just while we're here, we'll introduce our latecomers, Brian Coggins and Les Andrews and Terry Higgy have joined us now. So we have a full complement here on the stage of people that will come to us. For those of you who weren't here when the question was asked, I will read it back. Without using the word process, or the idea of both sides sitting at a round table, what location, please be specific, in Port Hope would be your ideal location to build a new building to house the 160 long-term care beds uh, from the Hope Street Terrace and Regency Manor? And we've had uh, a couple of people talk about that already. Would anybody else like to jump in and answer that question? No, all right. So question number two. Hi, I live in Ward 2, and um, people in Ward 2 have a lot of the same gripes as people in Ward 1 have. The road maintenance, internet, uh, too slow, too fast, um, too expensive, and taxes. But the one issue that is different in Ward 2 is the LLRW fund uh, issue. The lawsuit um, that Ward 2 uh, sort of feels that they lost. And the and how the ten million dollars and the interest are being handled. Um, can you elaborate on what can be done to address this ward two issue? And I'd especially like to hear from the mayor since he's likely the, the most familiar with the LLRW issue. Thank you, Bob. Uh, this is an issue that I think will never die. And when I looked for election the last time, I thought it would be solved at a coffee table. Um, it, it took a, a major, uh, two le major legal actions. To sp specifically answer the question, the LLRW $10 million fund was established as a hosting fund by the federal government, one set for what was Hope Township at the time, and one set for Port Hope. So those who $10 million were subject to the sites to store the product being licensed. I just let you, so you know where, where it came from and, and how it occurred. Uh, that is a benefit the community uh, had in monetary funds to accept the uh, low level uh, waste and have it stored here. It then got confirmed because the license was given. So that meant we could keep the $10 million for the rural and the $10 million for urban. But they were under two sort of different separate legal agreements, one written by Hope Township at the time and one written by the urban. And the one that was in the rural area um, got contested because there were some concerns that the funds and the, well, the funds might have been touched and that the uh, interest that was generated was not used in accordance with the intent. 
which was for the benefit of the residents. And the court case, uh, the reason we appealed, the court case was really about whether it is a trust fund or an investment fund. A trust fund, for your information, uh, goes away after 21 years. And we established and wanted to establish that it was not a trust fund. And we were successful in that. Which means now that $10 million is absolutely protected in perpetuity. <coughs> Bar none, nobody can touch it. Right? The second part, what is happening with the interest? The interest in the legal agreement says, for the benefit of the residents of the rural ward, Ward 2. It does not clearly define what the benefit is, but this council, I think properly, we applied 80% of the revenues generated to lower the taxes in the rural ward, and 20% we are putting back into the investment to keep it you know, prorated so it doesn't just diminish over you know, 50 years or something, so it doesn't seem like much. That will continue, um, and to be very, very clear, I'm proposing that we bring forward a bylaw that clearly states in the bylaw that the funds cannot be used for anything except reducing the taxes in rural ward two. I will say that we'll want to keep the same 80-20 rule. If the population doesn't want it, they'll see that $10 million decrease over time. But a bylaw does not make it firm that that's the only thing that could happen to it. It makes it very transparent and public. So if for any reason a future council would like to change that, they'd have to go through a bylaw process. So to answer your question, the $10 million is protected for the residents of World War II in perpetuity and cannot be touched. Second, there will be funds generated from it that will vary according to the investment programs and the amount of interest. Those funds will be used to lower taxes in Ward 2 and nothing else when that bylaw is passed. And I'm sure that council will pass it. Is your question answered? Okay. And I agree with 99% of what Bob has, has said as being true and accurate and a good reflection of what really happened. Uh, the only thing I would do is I, I wouldn't limit us by passing a bylaw on this issue uh, because there may be an occurrence in the future where Ward 2 or the rural people would like to use that interest for something else, something unforeseen, uh, and I don't want to really have to tie our hands up by a bylaw. I think we go on a, uh, a handshake, a, uh, uh, a gentleman's agreement, uh, and keep going the way we're going, and we review it annually to make sure that's what the majority of the uh, rural people want, and then uh, proceed from there. Bob? Let the battle begin. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be clear about a bylaw. It just makes it transparent. Right? It doesn't mean it can't change. So you're not tying anybody's hands at all. All you're doing is making sure that the needs of those residents are being met and are transparent to everybody. And if any council wants to change it, or the people want to change it, for whatever reason, you just change the bylaw. But you can't change the bylaw without being totally visible, publicly done, and going through the whole process of changing that bylaw or rescinding the bylaw. So all it does, it does not tie up anybody, but it certainly clarifies what the funds are to be used for by the current population that's been very clear. If that changes, you're not tied. Right? But then you have to change the bylaw. And I would <laughs> be very careful about doing that at the residence of War II isn't, if it's not what they want. We, we've met them all. They're farmers and people in the country and they have really big muscles and all that stuff. So, no, I'm, I'm, I'm good with what I'm doing. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, very good summary. Thank you, Bob. Uh, and I think it was fairly accurate. I guess what I want to stress, uh, and I'm running for a Ward 2 seat, and I'm stressing to be a strong voice for Ward 2, particularly with respect to taxes. And I think one of the issues I keep hearing in Ward 2 is that 
we're not asking uh, the people in War II what they want. It's their $10 million. They were the host of the site at the time the agreements were put in place. And we need to ask them. We need to ask the people of War II what they want instead of telling them we're going to do a bylaw or we're going to do this or a handshake deal. And these may end up being the, the, the approaches that were, are undertaken. But I think what I keep hearing is, is War II wants to be included in the decision-making process of what happens to, uh, to that $10 million fine. And I think that's the most important part of this. Uh, you know, I think there's going to be a process. I think we need to engage uh, our citizens of War II, of which I'm one, and, and we just don't want to be told this is how it's going to proceed. So I think, you know, and I do thank you, great idea. I think, you know, you know the idea of, uh, of a handshake deal or form formalizing it in some sort of a bylaw fashion, I think those are good suggestions, but I think we need to ask the people of War II what it is that they want, and then we reach a decision after that. Thank you. Do any of the candidates want to add to the conversation about the Terry? Um, just one final quick thing. In terms of, of going to the doors and talking to people in uh, the rural ward, there still seems to be a significant, I guess, misconception, for lack of a better word, in terms of the process that we went through. Even today, I got a number of people who said that, you know, we didn't get what we wanted, we got screwed, and there was a whole number of comments. So I think one of the things we must do is we need to have better communication with the residents of War II to explain that they haven't lost anything, but they have, in fact, gained what they were supposed to get in the first place. So this goes back to the whole idea of communication, and I think that goes back, to Christine, to part of your question, with respect to having the people of the rural ward understand that they're not in a negative position, but right now they're in a very positive position. I'm also running for ward to counselor. Um, I tend to uh, disagree in some aspects from a comment that was made earlier. The rural residents under the um, Hope Township made a decision that they wanted the revenues generated by that $10 million uh, investment, they wanted that to be used to lower their tax base. Yes, it sort of got sidetracked along the way, but in the last four years of, of the current council, it has been turned around and it is being used for what the residents wanted. If there's something additional that they want that fund used for, the, or the revenue from that fund, then we need to know uh, what that is so that we can look at it and uh, make a decision on that request. You know, I don't think there's any question that War II residents want that money to be used to lower taxes. That isn't the question. I think what's happened, though, over the years is that people in War II aren't feeling that they're getting any advantage of it. And, and I don't know whether it's the combination of area rating and how War II is paying for sidewalks and War II is paying for street lights and War II is paying for traffic lights, none of which they really have. And I think the impact, as much as we can say we're using that money to, to lower taxes, people aren't feeling it. And, 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 and it's not, you know, everyone understands impact and the assessments and they go up and et cetera, et cetera. That's not the point. The point is, is that War II, what I've been hearing is that, is that there seems to be a real disconnect between, uh, between not just the extending of this $10 million, but, but overall, the overall component of taxes in War II People have been telling me they are frustrated and they are fed up with being told what to do. That they don't like the area rating component with respect to paying for sidewalks and street lights and traffic lights. One could say it only amounts to so much on their taxes, but it's the philosophical approach to it. And I think that's what needs to be revised and changed moving forward. 
I've heard comments about having more unity and except that's all great, but we have to get down to the brass taxes and we have to be fair in how we're approaching taxes in War Two. Can you pass the mic to Les? Thank you. The uh, subject that Peter's talking about is common and uh, uh, special services that was revised uh, in 2017. Uh, the working group consisted of uh, two gentlemen from the uh, rural area, two from the urban area, uh, myself and David Vax, the director of finance, among others. And the, yes, you know, we heard all the complaints about, well, my cow doesn't use the street lights in uh, downtown and, uh, you know, we don't go downtown very often, so we don't use the sidewalks. Why should we be paying? And we thought about that and said, well, you know, you got a good point there, but should one of your bridges go in the uh, rural area, um, would you rather 4,000 of you pay for it, or would you like 16,500? So if we're one community, we're one community. And I guess we made a harsh statement, and the statement was that, look, you're not home township anymore. You're part of the municipality of Port Oak. So we're one community, and this is the way the community at large has chosen to go ahead. Times, so let's no. just speak the last time you speak about it. If you want to speak at it again, but we'll let that be the final word from you on that. No. Yeah, we can speak about it, but let's let that be the last one. Okay. Does anybody else want to talk about the LLRW money? No. Great. Let's take next to question number three, please. Hi. Debbie Beatty, Ward 1. Um, can you share three reasons why you feel that the municipal government should support the arts? And further to that, can you share your plan to support the arts in Port Hope over the next four years and beyond? And because I know you had a tense meeting just before you came here, bonus points if you can answer in your best pirate voice. <laughs> <laughs> Would anybody like to answer that question? <laughs> in a pirate voice only. Yeah. <laughs> Miles, <laughs> So three reasons that uh, arts are important, and then the secondary part was what what I do. Okay. So the three reasons that arts are important are because one, it makes the, the community that you're in a better place to live in general. Uh, I think uh, when we look around at arts festivities that we all celebrate, the things that we tell other people about our community are some of the festivals. Uh, bringing culture and making culture front and center are the things that attract new people. So uh, number two, it brings in new bodies and it convinces new people why they should come and enjoy our community. So it benefits tourism, but it also just makes it cool to talk to your relatives, which I think is a big bonus. I love telling the story about sliding down our main street on a giant water slide. What? Uh, number three is that it has huge economic benefits. So when you invest in arts, the ramifications kind of trickle around in a, in a pretty broad pool. So by doing arts investment, you get people involved in community programming. Uh, they want to stay around, but also they invest locally often in the events that happen. So think about Slide Street, for example. It's shut down the main street, but it also turned it into a giant pedestrian walkway where people were encouraged to get out and enjoy Poor Pope's down town for the entire day. So we had bands playing, we had specials on by uh, all of the restaurants, and all of the, the uh, like clothing shops, that sort of thing, had sales on. So it's a, a boon to the economy when we invest in uh, arts. Uh, three things that I would do. So I'll, re I'll read the question back yep. for you. And can you share your plan to support the arts in Port Hope over the next four years? and beyond, even during economic downturns? Yeah, so uh, one of the ideas that's out there, uh, which I'm very much in support of, is basically adding a budget line for arts and culture programming. So uh, I've spoken before in some of the stuff that I've said about an increased need of collaboration in Port Hope. One of the things that I'd like to see is a budget line for culture that we can work with community groups that put on arts programming so that the approach in Port Hope can be magnified. Basically, that means that we provide funding to organizations that can put on initiatives for us, uh, rather than putting all that responsibility on an already limited town staff. Thank you. Awesome. 
like to clarify one comment. Uh, during the next four years, there will be no economic turndown. <laughs> Three reasons the cultures are important. I, I think we're going to touch upon the same sort of things. Cult culture, you know, is what we are. Uh, we're, we grew up with it. We teach our children it. Uh, we live it every day. We're not a community without culture. Right? And culture comes in many forms. It comes in plays. It comes in written work. It, it comes in street art. So I think that the comment about budgeting for it is absolutely critical. We've had the conversation about should it be a community grant. If it's something that continues, you know, is going to go benefit the community overall, you know, then we should actually put it as a budget item. When you also look at all the options that there are culture, it's all inclusive, right? And it isn't always traditional. So I think we should open our minds and look at, you know, other options being culture. It may not be what I think is culture, you know, whether it be classical music or, or musicians or whatever, but we are so blessed with the number of people with talent and culture in our community we, we also need to support and bring them together. Um, the things I would do, I don't know if that's three, but it, it's enough. I, I do do whatever. I can't play an instrument, but I love to do them. So when it, when it comes to what I would do, the budget item is, is absolutely critical. I don't care what your priority is. If it's not in your budget, don't put it as a priority because it's not. When it comes to um, some of the other things, I would, I would continue, and I've been working for the last year and a half, almost two years, to uh, get the RBC building uh, under our control. And we're, we're very close. And if we do that, we add the opera hall. And so I would put that as one of the things I would continue to push right, and work with RBC. And by the way, RBC has been absolutely wonderful in all the discussions. So anybody who thinks that they you know, are holding out, I'd, I'd like to give them kudos. They've been holding back selling the building, been working with us, um, and, and there's some challenges. And, and then I would, very much support um, some of the more eclectic uh, type of things. We supported the uh, train station, little train station uh, moving in, and I think we can start to, to grow themes. And I think we can start to have uh, festivals that include art. Uh, one of the festivals that I, we don't have yet that I would really like to have, a salmon festival. The number of people that come to Port Hope to yeah. see the fish run, you know, so is education, pictures, uh, nature, uh, that's all culture to me. Right, so you know, understanding the environment. And when I talk about a festival, we're not there yet, but I think we're close. We, we have a lot of activities. A festival to me is not just a one day event. It would be, you know, when all the restaurants doing, you know, something with respect to it, school trips, that's all culture. And when they hit one piece of our culture, I'd like to see them reverberate and hit all the pieces of culture. So when people start to say, where should I live? And I'm a talented person, Port Hope should be number one in your list. Thank you. Would you like to speak? I'll put you on the list. No, 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 yeah, you're after Todd? Yep. Uh, thank you, Maggie. <laughs> Power? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I can keep going with three, because we're doing a pretty good list, uh, but there, I, I have an add-on for it. And I think one of the things that's really important about arts is it actually is community, right? Like when you start looking at the arts, it draws people out of their homes, it draws people together, it draws people over a, a common sense of something. Uh, it gives you perspective, especially when you're looking at cultural events. You get to learn things about each other. You get to see your neighbors differently. You get to understand where they came from. You get to understand you know, the footsteps that they've gone through. And the arts does that in a way that no one else and nothing else can do, right? So I think you know, if we don't support the arts, if we're not adding into that, uh, we're actually doing a bit of a disservice. Uh, with that then, the arts actually helps a lot with mental health. Um, it takes people out of their homes who are otherwise isolated. It gives them a reason to come out and be a part of the community when they feel there's no other reason to be there. So if we're not supporting that, we're really doing a disservice to the people that we, uh, that we have in our community. What do you do moving forward? These are all great ideas. The only thing I would probably add to that is it doesn't always have to be financial, although, you know, hey, if it rained money, that'd be awesome. But if someone wants to do a street festival, then we can help by getting the street closed and giving them the space. 
uh, someone wants to be able to do uh, you know, a fundraiser, we can help to promote it. Like there's different things that we can be doing to try and help the arts survive uh, that doesn't have to be always financial, but it can certainly be above and beyond. <laughs> um, and no one, and all the ideas are wonderful, but no one has talked about children, and I think we need well-rounded children. It's wonderful to play baseball, it's wonderful to play hockey and skating and all those other sports, but our children need to be well-rounded, and there needs to be programs for all children. And whether we started in the school system, um, I will say my two granddaughters go every Friday night to our class and every night is a different thing. Last week we brought home tie-dyed shirts. Um, they're, they're doing all sorts of different, so it's just exposing them to what is, is out there. And we have to have well-rounded children if we want this to continue. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to bring my notes so I don't forget anything. Because um, lots of these have been touched on already. I think going back to youth engagement, that's a big, big part of arts and culture. Um, and we, we have a, an issue with youth engagement in our town. Look around you right now. You know, there are two people under 30 here. Right? Ashley's one of them. My son, <laughs> my son is 10. OK, four people under 30, you know. Um, so uh, arts and culture are a great way to get those people involved. And I agree, you know, looking at the school system, uh, in terms of planning for the next four years, I think one of the things we, we really need to look at is, is youth creative space. Um, you know, we have a potential new senior center coming. What's going to happen to Ruth Clark? Well, wouldn't that be great if we could turn it into a space for youth to go and, you know, start a band, do some art, things like that. Um, the other important thing that, that Todd touched on a little bit is that art helps raise awareness um, of things that are going on in the community. I think a great example of, of something that's going on right now are the salmon down in Lend Lane and Critical Mass's um, message of uh, migration uh, around that. Uh, one of the things, and again, look around you, there are other communities in our town uh, who, you know, we don't necessarily know their stories. Um, and you know, us going around and talking to them individually, we get to hear some of that stuff, and, and I don't know that the town at large knows those things, and how they arrived here, and how being welcomed into Port Hope was. So how can we use art and culture to help tell stories like that and raise awareness about issues like that? Um, a couple of other things that I think are important to look at in the next four years, uh, certainly involving our arts and culture organization in revisiting the waterfront plan. You know, that, that's gonna be probably one of the biggest things that the next council deals with, is solidifying what happens with our waterfront. And making sure that our wonderful local organizations who do things like make beautiful spaces and beautiful experiences should be deeply involved in figuring out what that plan looks like. Uh, and the other thing that's come up recently is uh, we're going to revisit our film policy. You know, we just had a, a largely wonderful experience having a big production in town that spent a lot of money here, put a lot of money into the economy. There were some issues with it, and we need to revisit that policy because we've never had a production of this size in town. So we need to make sure that we're doing that smartly. Uh, and that is a big piece of our arts and culture as well. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I agree with most of what's been said. I'll just add one little thing that's been kind of alluded to, but not really clearly stated, and that is the opportunities for volunteering. You know, art and culture in this community is the mainstay of many of the volunteers in this community, and that is really important to people. But even if the art and culture they're working on is not fabulous, the fact that they get out of the house and they get involved and they socialize and they meet with other people and they get organized and they learn new skills, and you can take that to a higher level, not only the, the first tier of volunteers, but also the people that organize these things, join the committees and the boards and run these events. There is a learning opportunity there and a volunteering opportunity there that is very important, kind of separate from the art and culture itself. Thanks, Valerie. One of the other things that, we, that comes with this is the ability to have a focus. Because if, if we look at what this community is about in years gone by, it's, it's considered a place to come for antiquing or do this or do that. 
But now we have an opportunity to really give a focus for the, for the municipality as an arts entertainment center. What does that allow us to do? That allows us, our marketing department, to really have a very tight and yet broad focus at the same time to market to the entire province, even the entire country. And again, a lot of the ideas expressed here tonight are fabulous and, and can all be engaged in a broader process. But the, the fact is that we get a really good opportunity for a very smart, intelligent focus that we can market and really market well. Anthony, can you, Terry, would you pass um, Anthony the microphone, please? I just want to see him hobble over here. <laughs> uh, I'd like to make two observations that re relate to um, business and economic growth. Uh, I think it was last year, early in the summer, there was a dance festival in town. People came from all over Ontario, and the place was jammed. You couldn't get a seat in a restaurant, the stores were crowded. But the biggest bottlenecks were on the streets of Walton Street, on the sidewalks of Walton Street, around the storefront windows of the real estate agents. All these people were out of town. They had their notebooks out and they were copying down listings. Okay. The second observation is a more general one. It relates to society at large value of the arts or how society values the arts. If you kick out the uh, robber barons from Bay Street, the most financially rewarded group of people in society are, are artists, rock stars, actors, and I think that speaks well to how much the arts are appreciated at large. Thank you. Does anybody else want to speak to the question of Bob? Just a couple of added comments because I, I think the think tank process works very well. It's part, kind of like part of the arts too. Um, we have a very strong parks and rec uh, department, and uh, given the children concept and some of the messages, you know, I think we need to make sure that the arts and culture are strongly included in those programs. Um, you know, when they when they come out each year. And the other thing I want to mention um, is that we're seeing more multicultural events. You know, and I think we have to promote those as well. I know it's Hispanic Month this month, and uh, we, we see more of this coming into our community, and, and it, we really can embrace it. Uh, the cultures and the arts and some of the things that come from some of these um, other nationalities are, are tremendous. So, again, just to mention multicultural, and that we do have the facility with Parks and Rec to probably up the ante a little bit on, on the children's programs through, through the Parks and Rec. Great, we'll go on to question number four, please. On all the pamphlets that we've received, no one has mentioned seniors. With so many seniors paying taxes here, why is there never any money in the budget for their needs, except for the $14,000 park across from the Ruth Clark Center that only the geese use? <laughs> I would like to know what you are going to do for our aging population. Would anybody like to speak to that? Bob? And then, and then I think somebody uh, has, has to start off. Um, we're an age-friendly community, and you know, we are moving forward, um, certainly with respect to the activities that seniors have. But when we're age-friendly, I consider that you know, all ages. And that park across from the uh, Ruth Clark Center is uh, geared to start to integrate seniors with uh, children and other uh, adults as well. Um, the Ruth Clark Center is without question uh, needing replacement, um, and I think that's an investment that we need to have. We have an accessibility uh, committee, you know, very much geared to those needing accessibility and seniors. Uh, I think we have a fairly good um, grounding and, and a start to uh, expand on the senior activity, uh, but I don't think that we're so far behind that there's, there's neglect. Um, so I think that from a budget perspective and from uh, an activity perspective, we're on the road. We, we got an award, um, and again, this is under Parks and Rec, uh, but the municipality did get an award for being age friendly, and that's because we had marketed and put together a good plan. The next step is to implement the plan, 
and to get uh, involvement uh, with, with the seniors as well. So I think we're on the path. Um, there's, it would be nice to say, you know, senior get lower tax and all that kind of stuff. That's not the job. Right? The job is to make sure that seniors are integrated on an equal basis you know, with the rest of the population and that we consider their needs. I think uh, a couple of the councillors have talked about pedestrian requirements. Right? It's hard to cross some of the roads in Port Hope. Right? And uh, some seniors have trouble getting across in time and not every driver is considerate. So it's an area as well with the parks and rec and some of the activities that I think you'll see a, a focus continuing, but, but it isn't like it hasn't started. It's, it's fairly strong and it already has fairly strong municipal support. We just need to you know, expand on it and we do need to get engagement from the seniors on down. Uh, otherwise, you know, we're making decisions that may not be correct. And I'm gonna go back because one of the things, <laughs> even on Peter Street, you can't cross Peter Street, it's four lanes. And <laughs> people are running over to McDonald's. I've seen seniors try it <laughs> and then they can get about halfway. All right, so things like that we, we need to do. We need to make sure that the river walk is accessible uh, for everybody, but that seniors can get out and enjoy it too. So we're on the right path, but we have lots to do. Thank you, that was an excellent question. Um, it goes without saying, I'm going to do everything I can to make sure that we have long-term care in Port Hope. Uh, but there's other issues, and, and those are the frail elderly seniors or those with disabilities that you know make it very difficult for them to live in their home setting. But what about the senior who's 70, 75 years old, almost 80, but managing extremely well? Um, most of us out there are just going to have our pension. I sat in the parking lot yesterday and spoke to a, a lady coming out of the high school, and she said to me, her mother, 81 years old, is looking for an apartment in town. There is nowhere that she can, she can live. Where are we going to find affordable housing for our seniors? And because if we sell our houses or, you know, we don't own a house, let's face it, we don't have a lot of money. And uh, so there's going to be a large number of people that need affordable housing. And we need to seriously look at that and how we're going to uh, be able. I mean, look at the price of apartments. Uh, $1,200 for a one-bedroom apartment in town. Most people, that's their full pension. What are they going to live on the rest of the month? So we'd have to do some serious thinking about this and, and some planning. Uh, accessibility, Bob just brought up. That's huge. That's absolutely huge. It is sad to hear about family members trying to push uh, their, their wife, their mother, around town, and they, they can't do that. You can't get into a, many of the stores in town. Like, what are we going to do to address this? And I think that that has to be done, and, and it needs to be done sooner than, than later. And um, I am definitely going to be outspoken for seniors in this community, because I'm going to be one very, very soon. And I plan on staying here not 50 years, as other people have mentioned. I don't think I'll be around that long. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can hope. I'll be a hundred and something, but anyway, no, sorry, I'll only be 70 then. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, we need to start thinking about our seniors, we need to start thinking about our youth, but that's uh, an excellent question, thank you. <laughs> Anybody else like to answer the question? Yes? As, as a side with uh, Colleen on affordable housing, um, one thing we probably don't need much more of is planning and studying. Yeah. Uh, we've only been doing this for the last 50 years at the federal, provincial, and county level. And where has it gotten us? Nowhere. Um, I think we had a token um, build in, in Coburg of a minuscule number of houses compared to the population. And I think we have to take things into our own hands here in Port Hope. We do have $10 million. We do earn $300,000 a year on that money. We can go out and borrow and use the interest to pay it back, or the interest we earn to pay it back, and we can acquire land and at least make it a little more palatable for a developer to come in and build a facility <clears throat> that we can help dictate what type of facility it is. And we can um, cover the cost of the land or, or, or give uh, him a a real break uh, rental-wise on the land. He owns the building. 
and uh, let's get things moving. We got to do things differently because what we've been doing in the past hasn't worked. So we talked about uh, affordable housing in terms of building it, creating it, and so on, and we've talked about long-term care for seniors. What we haven't talked about is seniors who already own a home but are having difficulty staying in it because their taxes and their water bills and so on keep rising every year. Um, the, the cheapest thing that we can do is help them stay in that home because if they lose that home and have to go into some sort of uh, social housing situation, it's going to cost us a lot more in the long run. So an idea that I have just started noodling with, and it's not fleshed out yet, but is uh, copying or looking at what the City of Toronto has done, where they have property tax relief and water bill relief for qualified seniors who are low income earners and on a fixed income. There's a process they have to apply every single year, and they don't get their taxes reduced. But what happens if there's an increase in the tax that is not added to their bill? Same for their water bill. And it's for people who make, I believe the last uh, 2017 in Toronto, it was $50,000 or less combined household income. And it, could, it worked for seniors, and it was also available for people that had a disability and receiving disability payments. Mm. Okay, great, thank you. We're gonna move on to question number five now. Does anybody have question number five? Question number six. This is a little bit too high, but I think I have a flow. I was going to help you. My question is about property taxes. And that was very interesting that you mentioned about seniors, many seniors. As I look around in this room, I see all the, just the heads could define them. What? <laughs> you know, and it's, and being, I'm, I am a realtor, I'm not promoting myself, but I know the prices of homes, I know the prices for rental, it makes it very difficult for seniors to actually afford their homes. So then, as, as someone mentioned, that they are forced to go to rental, which is, it should not be. So what would each of one of you do about property taxes? In Port Hope here, it's higher than in Vaughan, Toronto, Whitby, um, Pickering, is much higher than any one of those areas. Yeah. Is that your question? Yes. yes. Okay, great. You can grab a seat. I'll just take your car. And okay. here, Angela is going to go. I have some other questions in here, too. Okay. It's, do they relate to the same topic? No. Okay. Then when we get around to the next okay. round, then so I'd like to hear. Sure. Peter. <coughs> Thank you for your question about taxes. You know, taxes are a huge issue for the people of Ward 2. You know, um, I think this is, and I've heard this said before, I've heard it from some very learned people uh, in my time here as the Director of Works and Engineering here in Port Hope. Um, this is a question about needs and wants. And we've got to start making some choices about what we need and what we want. And there are going to be some tough decisions. If we want lower taxes, then some of these things that we want are going to have to give way to making sure we reduce those taxes. It's really just a simple question of economics, folks. This isn't rocket science. I know we're talking about putting money in the budget for this and that. These are all good ideas, but you can't have everything in life. You're going to have to make some real decisions. The people in War II, they want lower taxes. They want better roads, they want better snow plowing, and they want better taxes. It's as simple as that. I keep hearing it over and over again. So to do that, we have to start cutting out the waste. We got to start cutting out things like spending $100,000 on limestone sidewalks at Town Hall. We got to start cutting out things like, uh, oh, I can go on, but I'm not going to tonight. But I'll be quite honest with you, and I've heard it from some very learned people, and I'm looking at it right now. It's a question of needs and wants, and we got to start really focusing on that. It's, and, I've, and, and Bob said it here earlier if it's not in the budget, it's not going to get done. But on that same token, we can't be everything to everyone. So. Appreciate the question. My, fo my focus here, if I'm elected in Ward 2, is to really focus on the needs and wants and to keep those taxes in check and get them lower. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Sam, with the question of what are you looking for taxes, it's not about um, cutting back on wants. Okay. 
Okay, a candidate has the, the choice to answer the question however they want. I've, I've, as we've said before, everybody on the stage wants to be liked and they want to get elected, so how they answer the question can be reflected at the polls. So go ahead, Sam. Taxes are a function of what it costs to administer Port Hope. We have fixed costs, we do a budget, and we calculate the taxes. A way around that, very simply, is to spread the tax base. And the tax base will be spread in two ways. One, by building more residences, and two, looking for economic <coughs> development. So that look for economic development, I think, from a tax point of view, is a real priority. It will also build our community, too, because people will come and have a place to work. Thank you. I wasn't sure if you were indicating to me. No. Anybody else like to? Les, please. And then, sorry, Miles, did you want to speak too? I'll have you next. Thank you. Is Miles next? No, Les, you go ahead. Okay. To uh, further amplify Sam's point of view, we, um, as you know, we've sold out our business park and we were uh, on the verge of acquiring more land in that area to um, attract more businesses and uh, an initiative came our way which we can't talk about uh, we're under confidentiality agreement with the feds the county and uh, um, there is a very large project that if it comes will be a very significant um, addition to our town in terms of jobs and industries and spin-offs uh, and that has held us back from acquiring more land at the business park i know it's not much of an answer, but it's one way, as Sam said, to attract more to spread the base. And you, and you look at all the communities that you mentioned in terms of, well, my taxes are, are higher than Mississauga or Pickering, or, and look at the number of people that are in Pickering and the quality of life they're enjoying. So, you know, we don't have that many people, but we sure do have a good quality of life. Um, I would just uh, approach things in a little bit of a different way insofar as I think one of the principal things that we need to be putting our mind to is, has already been touched on, but I think it directly impacts taxes, which is how do we get people able to, to uh, move here and have affordable housing? So we need to uh, increase the tax base because I think that we're doing a good job from the current council in terms of attracting businesses, but those businesses require employees. And so I would want to invest quite a lot of effort into an actual consolidated uh, approach to bringing in affordable housing that uh, we can attract families because families are pretty great at paying taxes over a long term. Uh, so we need to look at the, the types of people that are that are moving here that can contrib contribute to the economy over the long run, uh, and that's where I would pay my uh, attention. Todd, um, so I think one of the questions, well, part of the question was how do we keep our seniors in our homes? Really, and and although. One of the solutions is if we can lower their taxes, that would help. Um, I think something that actually can solve that and speak to the affordable housing problem that we have and we're facing, and it's going to come when this industrial park comes, we don't have the people who are going to be able to work there. We have the ability to uh, help and zone so that uh, people could have basement apartments. Uh, be able to take their homes and, and change them up. So as a senior, I could be drawing a rent out of my basement or parts of my home that I'm no longer using, uh, which would help offset the costs of, and be able to leave me in my home uh, and give an affordable place for other people to live uh, so that they can come and enjoy the jobs that are going to be coming down the, the pipe. Cause uh, those two are going to actually go hand in hand, I think, as we as we move along, right? Um, Colleen, I think you said earlier, you know, the average price of a one bedroom is twelve hundred dollars, right? So if you were, you know, making fifteen dollars an hour and it's forty hours of work, that's six hundred dollars uh, a week. You're only making twenty four hundred dollars a month to make an affordable housing. You'd have to be paying eight hundred bucks. So you don't get to live in a one bedroom here, but if you can you know, do some of this uh, where people can share their homes and have basement apartments and we can do that through bylaws and, and zoning, um, that actually solves a couple of problems. Yeah, 
you know, thanks. I'm really glad to hear all the support for more housing because this is what I've heard in War II time and time again is War II wants more severances, particularly on lands that is not arable, lands that have not been farmed in 30 years, but we have, and I got, I ran out of time last night when I presented to, uh, uh, to the audience there. But we need to amend our official plan, our zoning bylaws. We need to put policies in place to have more housing in War II, particularly on land that is not arable. So I really appreciate it. I'm really glad to hear that here tonight. <laughs> There's only one taxpayer, and uh, you're taxed on uh, school, on the county, and municipal. And some of the focus gets only on municipal. And <clears throat> I think when you do that, you lose sight of some of the uh, ambulance services, the social services that are your taxpayers' uh, dollars are paying for. You should get value for money, right? And uh, we've had a legacy you know, in Port Hope, I think, of maybe spending a little bit too much uh, compared to our revenues. And I think Sam said it, um, there's a cost to running a municipality and you have some choices in there. Some of those choices are lifestyle, quality of life. Uh, some are you know, more significant, you know, with which you, you really don't have a lot of choice about what you spend on. And I think when I first uh, ran uh, the last term, you know, I said we're living beyond our means. And some of that interpretation was you know, we should lower you know, what we're uh, spending on, um, and we should and be more efficient. But the idea is we need to increase our, our revenues because the amount that we're spending should stay approximately the same over time. The budget and money we need is, is directly related to service levels. So if you want better roads and you want better plows, you're not going to lower your taxes at the same time. Right? So there is a decision to be made and I think the priorities of what's coming up with this council, and I think within the municipality, you know, does focus on things like housing. You know, uh, affordable housing is not less necessarily low income housing. We do uh, see an expansion in our economic base, but we don't know we're going to get the workers. Uh, we have an 80 room hotel uh, that's going to be put up. Tremendous tax base, right? And, and it'll be wonderful. However, are they going to get the workers you know, to, that they need? So it, it's kind of like a, a vicious cycle. Uh, over the last four years, I think we've kind of got our house in order. Last year, uh, for the first time, I believe, we did not borrow money as a municipality. Right? We, in fact, had a bit of a surplus. And in our administration costs alone, by restructuring uh, the uh, directors and not having a CAO, we've got no CAO, and we have one less director than we had. Um, in the last four years, that saved us half a million dollars. In the coming four years, if we maintain that structure and we're adding one director to take, to take into their portfolio, the planning process, which is currently sitting with Public Works, and then we take also the economic development and tourism away from corporate services and put them in that new sort of portfolio, then that's the person in the portfolio that will drive things forward. And that will drive the ec economic growth we need. So this next four years, if we stay with that structure, we're getting higher efficiency. You know, and secondly, we're getting a, a saving over for the four years of about $1.2 million. So we start to take that and, and put it across the base. You know, we, we have some choices. We could cut back in some areas, but the decision is do you want to? And do you stabilize? And I certainly like the comments about tax relief when needed. You know, I, I think we do need to have a look at um, special needs you know, so people who are in economic duress. I, I do know, and I, I had a few laughs from a few people who said the taxes are lower in Toronto. And I said, sure they are, because the entire province is subs subsidizing. Right? <laughs> of course they are. And the federal government gives them money. Everybody gives them money. They don't have to be overly, you know, stringent, <laughs> I, I would suppose. So when, when it comes to how you know, we're going to handle it, we're, we need to be self-sustainable. I don't believe, and we had projects funded in this community during the 150, by not putting our hand out and demanding an asset for money, we put skin in the game and we accept some responsibility. And that's where we, I think we start to look after ourselves. And I think we're there. It's taken three years uh, to sort of restructure and get uh, I, our house in order, I guess, to some degree. We've got a lot of public engagement. We have a strategic plan. And we have some choices to make that are non-essential choices. 
Um, and, that, and that's where we'll start to you know, tighten things up a little bit. But as these things kick in over the four years, you know, I think we can stabilize. I think we can introduce some things, and I think as we've talked about with uh, Councillor Andrews, we need to invest ourselves you know, in some of the things we do. If we want affordable housing, we're not going to get it unless we do purpose-built, invested housing by the community. If we want culture, we need to invest. We cannot have our hand out all the time and ask for it. I think we're a good family, rural and, and urban. There's lots of economic opportunities in, in the rural area. The cottage industry and the arts and culture and things that are coming out in the farmer's market, the bigger farms are probably not doing as well. But the smaller enterprises, you know, the experiential things that are happening in the rural area and here, the spas and the things that are happening, they're all starting to come together. So I'm very optimistic that we can manage you know, going forward and we can have an opportunity to introduce specific programs right, where, where needed, whether they be for accessibility, whether they be for sidewalks. But let's have a good look at them. Let's decide what we do. Let's set the three or four priorities the community has, right, and let's focus on those, you know, and let's achieve them. So. And then we'll be moving on to the next question. Yeah, I'll, I'll just agree. I do want to speak to, and I'll respectfully disagree with, uh, uh, with, with the mayor on this matter. Um, so the South Going administration terminated 12 uh, uh, senior employees within the municipality of Porto. They spent hundreds of thousands of your tax dollars, some say millions, on severance pay. I think there's a lot better ways to spend millions of dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, on things that we need. Frankly, I heard the comment, we don't need a CEO. I respectfully disagree with that. I've heard many, many people say, council should not be running staff. Look, I'm a senior administrator in municipal government. I've been doing this for many, many years. We need a CEO. We need strong leadership at the top of staff to get things done. Heard the mayor talk about setting two or three or four priorities. That's great, let's set them. Because I've got three major priorities and more two that I want to get done in a short four year term. So I, I, I just want to impress upon you, look at this is about needs and wants. I agree with the mayor with respect to setting those priorities and I hope we can move forward together. Okay, so we, we are actually gonna stay on this topic now, Bob. And then I've got you next last. This is what's called a rebuttal. <laughs> and it's also correcting inaccurate information. Severance pays were paid out, and they were paid generously to seven people. Right? And it amounted to just over $500,000. And the savings I said in my first talk, our net saving was half a million dollars. We saved that 1.2 and spent five. We're not spending that five that coming up this time. So I think during election campaigns, people should check their information. Millions is not the same as $500,000 the last time I checked. It wasn't my bank account, by the way, I just checked the numbers. Right? And whether we need a CAO, absolutely debatable. The reality is the directors we have and the council we have meet, and they don't want one. A CAO, I think on large communities maybe is necessary. We have a very collaborative process. We had the best budget because we put five directors in a room and they spent a day or two sorting out their priorities and coming out with a mandate with their budget. What used to happen, and Mr. Enzo, who used to be with us, would probably have a conversation with a CAO and the next director would have the conversation. And the CAO would make the final decision relative to the budget without real consultation with the council. So I like the process that's going. I will totally support it until such time as there seems to be the need for a change. That change will come either from function and performance of the group being less than what it should be or a request. So let's keep the facts straight. It's not too many. It's $500,000 with a net gain of five hundred. dollars and a future benefit over the next two years, $1.2 million. That's huge on an $18 million budget.
Mine is going to be very short because Bob said exactly what I was going to say and he's 100% accurate on it. And, and I hate to say that, but he is. Um, <laughs> the overriding factor on the CAO was, uh, and Greg Burns, our deputy mayor, and I were charged with looking at the organization when we, when we hadn't even had actually taken over yet. I think we did it in November of 2013. And, we said, okay, what are we going to do? And uh, one of the overriding comments we got from the CAO was that, um, you know, that none of you counselors are going to meet with the director unless I'm in the room. Well, we resolved that problem very quickly. <laughs> Thank you. We'll take question number seven now, please. Hello to everyone. My name is Angela Brogan and I live in Ward 1 and I'm still on the initial T, transportation. Um, when elected, what are your plans for public transportation connecting rural and urban areas of Port Hope with neighboring towns that have Go Transit? <laughs> I'm actually very glad that you asked that question, thank you. There are two prime pillars of economic growth. One is communication, and the second is transportation. We struggle with transportation and uh, over the years, and we've made some significant changes with transportation within Port Hope right now, and we're going to be making a lot more. We're getting uh, new buses of which will arrive shortly. We've changed how we do our routes. We, we're going to be doing automation. We've taken transit into our own hands. We have our own manager now who will be doing this. So no third party. But to your question, you're talking about transit outside of Port Hope. And that's something that we need. People need to be able to get in and out of Port Hope easily, efficiently, and inexpensively. And right now, that is incredibly problematic. You can use the VIA train, and I think it's something like 20 tickets is about $600, so you're about $30 per, per ride. Very, very expensive. And it only stops in Port Hope a few times a day. So that's very difficult. So we really should have some conversation with VIA to see if we can, if we can get there. But secondly, in terms of GO, a lot of people here will go to the GO Transit Station in Oshawa if they can find a spot. <laughs> Otherwise, it's going to Whitby, and hopefully they can find a spot there. But if you're a one-car family, what happens? And only one of you going, that car gets left there. What we need to do is we need to find a transit system that will facilitate, probably jointly with Coburg and with Port Hope, so it makes more sense, to get transit into the GO station. Now, I realize GO is coming into Bowmanville, and I, I don't know, that may be 20, 2020 or so, or 2022, but wherever the closest one is to us, we need to either talk to GO Transit to facilitate uh, transportation here through buses or we need to take a look at having uh, some sort of trans transit system that we can rely on so that's something that we're looking into as a matter of fact the motion I put before council was to have our staff uh, come for a public information session to try and pull the public together to analyze what our needs are because it's a very good point that you made in the question but before we do anything about it, we really need to determine fully and completely what are our needs. I mean, I see some heads nodding out here. So it's, it's obviously that you want to be able to enjoy some sort of transit. But in terms of a community of 16,500 roughly, what does that amount to? So what would we have to do to satisfy that need? But again, I go back to the fact that we, I believe we do have that need and substantially to grow within the community Transit, transportation is a massive, important, significant factor, and thank you very much for asking the question. Thank you. So, David, we're just going to talk for 15 seconds to give David Broughton a chance to change the battery here. <laughs> By the way, if anyone wants to live tweet, do a hashtag town hall debate, hashtag PH Polly. Whoa. Awesome. There we get that. How many of you are live tweeting? <laughs> we're very, we're very sophisticated. I'm following. <laughs> okay, 
accurate now. Okay, okay. it says we're good. We're go. good to go. Um, so Terry pointed out that um, the GO train is coming to Bowmanville in 2021, I believe they've committed to. Um, I was on the GO train a few weeks ago. You're pulling into Oshawa and Whitby, and they, they go on and on and on about all the bus connections to Peterborough. Uh, I would expect that when the train comes to Bowmanville, we have a pretty strong case to be there saying, we need the bus to come to Coburg and Port Hope. You know, we have hundreds of people who take the VIA train every day from our two communities, uh, and that's expensive. And it means that if you want to take the VIA train at a regular time of day, you can't find a parking spot. Uh, so, you know, we have a pretty compelling case to go to Metrolinx and say, we need bus connections here. I think the other thing that we need to look at are some alternatives to the standard bus. You know, the bus here in town, I believe, stops once an hour at most stops. That's not terribly convenient, particularly if you're trying to get somewhere on a particular schedule. You know, it could take you three hours to get to a 10 minute appointment. There are some really interesting and innovative uh, transportation solutions that companies like Lyft and Uber are working on right now where the towns that they're working with are actually, in, in, a, in essence, subsidizing taxi rides. Um, but the amount of economic gain that those towns are getting is beyond the you know six dollars that they're paying uh, for that individual ride. So I think there are some other uh, interesting and innovative solutions that we should be looking at uh, in addition to our standard bus routes. Thanks. Thanks. I just want to follow up on a couple of comments in terms of. I was addressing transit issue. I think you were talking about in and outside of, of Port Hope, but in, in town as well. Just one of the other elements with the transit system here is that with automation that we're going to be putting in, into the bus system, um, we're already making a phase change in terms of how we've been doing the system. And uh, we have made a couple changes in terms of getting the bus from uh, Port Hope to Coburg every half hour rather than every hour. So that's a significant improvement. We've changed our local routes uh, we've, we've, we've moved out of some, some routes simply because we really weren't picking people up there. So we tried to improve that. So we do get down to town hall every half an hour so those buses can change. But one of the things we're looking at, and I think this is really important, and you did mention it partially, is that we will be able to develop through our own management team the software that will basically facilitate a kind of a Lyft or Uber type approach with the vans we're using here. So in other words, we won't even be doing routes at all. So we'll be able to reach the entire community by using this service. And if, we, if we're really good at this, we can probably move to this service within a year, year and a half. And that's a pretty quick change from what we've been doing. And it's, what we're doing on transit right now is a massive change than we've done over the past decade, where the only thing we, we would do is we would add 15 cents to the fare and knock a couple of hours off when the bus was available. So we're going through a significant successful transit change right now, and there's a lot more to come. Bob Sanders. Um, just to confirm, when we took office, uh, Metrolinx didn't know the East existed, and there, there was no intent to bring uh, go here. It wasn't even on their, their radar. Um, so through collaborative efforts with everybody East of here, including Coburg, you know, we, we talked to the ministry and Stephen Del Duca at the time, and we got a commitment right away to take um, the GO system to Bowmanville. Part of that discussion is without question that we need a station out in the Port Hope Coburg area. So that'll be, I think, a, a normal transition. And everybody talks about getting people out of Port Hope. Um, I talked to them because I wanted people in Port Hope. We need people coming here too, and we need students here. And we're working with Loyalist College. We're building you know, some very good programs um, with them and some with, with McMaster. We're becoming very innovative. We need young people coming here. And right now they may not be able to afford to be here, but I don't want to have the concept that GO is coming close so we can get out. GO is coming close so we can get in. The other thing is that VIA, uh, we've had ongoing talks including with uh, you know, MP Rudd, uh, they're a tough nut to work with. They don't get back to you. So any delusion about we're going to change VIA right away, you know, we're not. We're going to keep banging at them. And if it does change and we get some more stops, because we used to have more, and it's diminishing and it's a high cost, we're, we're probably going to have to sa have a sacrifice. And I bet Port Hope will get fewer stops. So you have more stops in Coburg, which makes our transportation requirements even, even more 
uh, stringent, but you're not going to get something without giving up something. So when I was talking with uh, Mayor Brock and who's not going to be there again because he's uh, gone and will uh, be going, the strong agreement we had was it cost Metrolinx a fair bit of money to put a station and every kilometer costs the money. So I figure we're going to probably have to sacrifice the increased via. They're, they're not going to want these two quick stops. You know, it's Bowmanville, then it's, you know, kind of Toronto, Oshawa. Uh, so for their business model, I'm sure they don't like what they have now. Economically, it's viable because we do have enough people, you know, paying that fee and, and going in. But two or three years from now, if we want to increase VIA, I suspect we're going to have to negotiate, you know, on that basis. And the negotiation that I had with Coburg was we want first dibs on the, you know, go transit station, you know, that's going to be here. So we're working on it. Um, the railroads, you know, they, they'll talk to you when, when they want to. Um, we have nice conversations about once a year. We talk about their whistles. They worry that we want to stop the whistles. How many, how many want to stop the whistles? <laughs> See, not, not so many, right? But, but, but it comes up all the time. And they're, they're, they're worried about it. And I say, if we don't stop the whistles, will you give us more stops? <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else want to talk about transit? No. We're going to move on to question number eight, please. Fast. 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 So, is question number nine then, please? Does somebody have question number nine? Question number ten. People took questions, took cards, but we didn't necessarily fill them in. So. <laughs> and over the card, hold up the hand. <laughs> My name is Bob Harrison. I'm a Ward 1 resident. Uh, this question is of a different nature than the ones we've been dealing with. I'm, it's not strategic, it's a little more down to earth. I'm wondering what uh, the folks on the, on the dais think about the picturesque collection of deserted buildings on the north side of Highway 401 on the east side of County Road 10. Uh, yeah. And what do you propose to do about it? Okay, who wants to talk about the, the old motel? Does everybody know the building that the question is about? The old motel. Yeah, the, there's up, up at yeah, up Highway 10, there's an old abandoned motel. It is actually currently for sale for, I believe, $1.7 million. Yes. <laughs> Terry Hickey. Picture up. Two dollars. And then we'll start the bidding at ten dollars. <laughs> you, you you weren't going to get it for two dollars. That simply wasn't going to happen. I'll do all that. Okay, I understand at one time that was a great restaurant to go to. Uh, it, it's run down just a little bit. Um, one of the, the, the most likely probabilities is dealing something with actually with the province. The land is so close to that interchange that the, the MTO is probably never going to allow anybody to build anything on that. And uh, the other thing is that uh, over time, as they're doing right now, Ministry of Transportation is basically uh, redoing the 401 right from Windsor to the Quebec border. So you will see at some time uh, this land gone, uh, and most likely we'll probably see that as an effective uh, landscape improvement program by the Ministry of Transportation. Uh -huh. Thank you. Will? Yeah, the old Welcome Motel was actually a property that the Canadian Firefighters Museum looked at acquiring. Uh, because it had an excellent location. At that time, which was only about 18 months ago, the asking was 2.4 million. Uh, the place is on well and septic, it has no water, and Terry is correct, it would be difficult to get an entry permit approved because it is so close to the interchange. Certainly if you got an entry approval, it would be right at the north end of the property. Um, so $2.4 million for eight acres with buildings that are absolutely in need of demolishing and I'm well and septic. Um, yeah, it's not a great opportunity, George. <laughs> Save your money. <laughs> Bob Samson. <laughs> um, 
this is an eyesore in the community. There's no question yeah. about it. <clears throat> We've been working uh, hard to try to get rid of it. Nobody's burned it down yet, so. Yeah. <laughs> our, our, our fire department could use a, a little bit of practice. We've only had a couple of fires this year. I'm gonna live tweet that. Yeah. So, one of the problems, um, our, our bylaw officer and chief building inspector, you know, are out there frequently because the best we can do with private property is keep it secure. Uh, we, we can't take it away. The owner has the right to keep the property. Uh, we've negotiated with him and asked him whether he, he would uh, take it down because it's an eyesore. Uh, he won't. And the reason is there's a mortgage on the property. And a mortgage was only there with buildings on. So, so there's some practical reasons that it's there. And the best we can do is keep making sure that there's not access you know, to, to drug traffic and, and everything else that has gone on there in the past. Keep it as clean as possible and keep it secure so kids won't have you don't go in there. Because if something should happen to them, we <coughs> don't want anybody in there. So our hands are fairly tied. Um, we've had the same thing with the file factory. You know, uh, we have you know, pushed that guy and put orders against them a, a lot of times to keep it secure. We've taken contractors and, and boarded it up. So as a municipality, we, we can do so much, but we can't do more than that. And I don't think we're gonna use tax dollars to buy it. Um, I don't think it's very valuable property. And I think as, as uh, Terry was saying, you know, the plans for you know, the, the uh, 401 and where the interchange is, it was gonna be here restrictive. And remember the water issue that Welcome has? You know, it's not a commercial supply of water, it's, it's residential. So the reality is, I don't think it has a lot of vi viability. Unfortunately, it's an eyesore. We can just continue to encourage and make sure that at least it's secure, and we can do what we can do to keep it as tidy as possible and keep the bylaws in. So, there you have it. I did, uh, when I contacted everybody about tonight, I did mention that we would take a, a short break at some point. It's just after nine o'clock. Does anybody need a little break? No. Nope. Okay, great. We're going to move on to question 11. Does anybody have question 11? Oh, that's Sorry, David. Hi, uh, Dave Broughton, Ward 1. Uh, I'd like to hear from just the councillors, and maybe we should start on the left and just go along. If elected, what is your preferred portfolio and why? Great question. So the rules of the, uh, of the debate tonight are that the questions are for all and any who wish to answer the question, so we won't make anyone answer it if they don't want to. Well, I think um, the portfolio that I would be interested in would be works in engineering. Uh, because I think Ward 2 needs uh, someone on council that will deal with the issues uh, under works in engineering. Uh, as we've heard, roads are important, bridges are important, uh, and there are many other things that fall under that portfolio. And I don't believe that Ward 2 has ever had uh, a councillor dealing with works in engineering. I prefer to keep um, finance, the police services board, the HBIA and civic wards, um, the police services board because they're half of the budget, virtually. Uh, finance is so that I can keep sort of my finger in all areas uh, of the uh, uh, municipality. Uh, civic awards because it's, it's very rewarding. I get to meet, I work with some very nice people. Some not so nice people. Not. Nice. <laughs> some very nice people, and it's always refreshing to be able to reward our citizens at HBIA because, quite frankly, it's broken, and we got to fix it. The one department currently that doesn't have a council representative is marketing and tourism. Uh, I have a background in marketing, and, and things are going to shift around a little bit with the community development director coming into place. Um, so, uh, and I think that means culture is moving over with marketing and tourism. Um, so I think that's, you know, given my background, makes a lot of sense. Um, and I think having a representative in that area makes a lot of sense as well. 
uh, Parks and Rec, because uh, one of the things that I've been uh, running on that I haven't been able to talk about is youth engagement. Uh, it's one of the things that I want to be able to focus on is making this a great place where youth can participate and actively build uh, back to Port Hope. Uh, I would also like to look at increasing the number of ways that we can make Port Hope a healthy place to live. Uh, I'm a big fan of outdoor paths, looking at the tree layout for the town, that sort of thing. And so I want to look at uh, the things that we're doing to carefully plan our paths and our outdoor activities so that people are uh, activated and energized when they go out there. Uh, I would go with uh, community and economic development. My background is in uh, business and economic development. Uh, I've been building businesses. I've had a few in Toronto. My uh, the company I own right now is uh, working with organizations and strategy, so it makes sense. It's a fit for me. I go with emergency <laughs> services, and I don't think anyone should be surprised by that. Uh, but my fallback position, if that wasn't available, would probably be Parks and Rec because of my fish and wildlife background. I have a ser serious interest in that. And one thing that was mentioned to me just today, I was approached by somebody who asked if I'd be interested in serving on the library board, and the answer to that would be a resounding yes. Well, I prefer it would be a works in engineering, uh, police. And I think a rascal that's in the grass is P-H-A-I. And I think that's going to be significant going down the road. And I think it would be a big challenge, the one that I would enjoy. I'm enjoying now. So here you are. So if I'm elected in War II, um, it sounds like I'm going to have sort of some competitors for works in engineering, uh, because that's the portfolio that I would much prefer. I've been a professional engineer for over 27 years. I specialize in roads and development. This is what I do for a living. I know that portfolio inside and out. I was the former director of works and engineering here in Port Hope for 13 years. I know how this system works. I know where to make the improvements, in particular to my friends and neighbors in Ward 2 who really want better roads, and better snow plowing, and better taxes. Um, I'm very interested in emergency services. My background is healthcare. Um, I think, you know, mental health issues are huge. I support CAMH. Um, I have a psychiatric nursing background. Um, I am very concerned about the social services and how the emergency service mix with social services, as well as accessibility, is is a big issue for me. Uh, planning is currently part of uh, works. It's going to be spun off, and that would be an area of interest that would, uh, I think I could be best to make a contribution to. I've enjoyed a 42-year career as a contractor and uh, interfaced with uh, developments for both the private and public sector, and have often taken the lead on planning issues uh, for these developments. So I do know the system, and it's also uh, planning and zoning uh, interface uh, strongly with um, my other big interest, which is, of course, heritage preservation. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. We'll go on to question. <laughs> we'll go on to question number 12 now, please. Does anyone have question 12? Question 13. The answer to question number one this evening included several locations. How many of these locations are within a few blocks of downtown Port Hope? And how would you expect residents, workers, and family members to access them in wheelchairs, walkers, and on their feet, since transportation for LTC is very costly and independence is something that we need to support in our residents? And what will residents see if they look out their windows if they are at one of these <coughs> other locations? Who would like to answer this? Yes, please. Well, I suggested two locations, 65 Ward Street and the area right behind the, uh, the new old hospital. Um, on Wellington, and 
the only one that meets all your requirements is 65 Warren Street. I didn't get here in time to answer that first question, so I'm going to. Would you like me to read the question? No, no, or I think I, I, I kind of bring it into play, but thank you. Um, I have to echo exactly what Les is saying. I mean, this is the spot for it. This is the spot that it should be in. This, this is the spot that is big enough, I feel, to do the job. It is in the right area. And I have to agree with the, with the questioner in terms of the fact that it's recognizing that if we move that building uh, far afield into some other area, it is more difficult for those who can move about by their electronic, uh, electric wheelchairs or whatever to get downtown and engage themselves in community activities. So again, I would say leaving it exactly where it is and ex expanding you know, the center over, uh, and, um, and I'll say this straight out, demolishing the old building, which if we, have to, if we have to move it to some other location, we'll now have an old hospital, an old, old hospital, and an empty healthcare building. We'll have three empty buildings now. So, so and yes, and with that, absolutely, it should stay exactly where it is. I'm totally in support of having Hope Street Terrace and Regency remain in the in the spot at 65 Ward Street. Um, there was some question earlier about uh, the difficulty with construction in your home. You have to realize that we are highly regulated by the Ministry of Health. And as the infection control nurse who works in that building, I will tell you if two ceiling tiles are removed, more than two ceiling tiles, I have to be called and we have to make sure uh, stringent, stringent practices are in place. We are highly regulated. There is no effect to the residents other than that they are not going to be able to walk on the area until that construction is completed. So it is really not going to affect the current residents living on that site now. And, and um, you know, we are highly regulated. There is no way that we would be allowed by the Ministry of Health to go ahead and make a choice like this without knowing the fallout from absolutely everything that happens during the construction process. So I have total trust in the system. I have worked in it for almost 40 years, and uh, I believe that 65 Ward Street is the best choice, and, uh, and we can do it with the Ministry of Health support and regulations, uh, and much more quickly than waiting and waiting and waiting. Thank you. We're going to have the question asked again, just so that everybody understands exactly what the question is asking. The answer to question number one this evening included several locations. How many of these locations are within a few blocks of downtown Port Hope? And how would you expect residents, workers, and family members to access them in wheelchairs, walkers, and on their feet, since transportation for LTC is very costly and independence is something that we need to support in our residents. And what will residents see if they look out their window? Thank you for indulging me. Okay, Todd, you're not up next. Uh, so I can't speak directly to the properties that came up because I actually don't know where they all are, but I, I have an answer for you. Um, in speaking to a Southbridge representative, the residents, hi Patrick, uh, the residents were described as frail and 80% of them have mobility issues. Uh, these folks, and we, you know, we talked about how do they get downtown, it's like, well, some of them wheel downtown. Well, from 65 Ward Street to downtown, you may be able to wheel down, but you're not wheeling back up again. Uh, yeah. So, uh, if we were on a larger property, the answer would be there would be enough green space and parkland around there, is actually the conversation that we had. And with that, they'd be able to then look out their windows and see green space. They'd be able to, with their limited mobility, be able to go through those paths. And that was a conversation that we had, and in fact, all three of us were there, 
Um, and it seemed then that five acres was the answer, not two and a half or three. Thank you, Tom. Would anybody else like to speak to this? Anthony, thank you. I just want to interject for a second. I know it's not really allowed. Sure. But for the rest of us, I actually don't care. If, council, if, the, can, if the candidates ask for clarification on the question, then they can ask for it. If not, then your question has been asked and they can answer it. If anyone on the stage would like to ask more about the question, please feel free. Anthony. The, uh, the issue of uh, mobility as it relates to downtown, I don't think is a deal breaker on this. If you really needed to get downtown as a part of your core activities and what you're providing for your cl uh, clients and your, your residents, uh, surely in a scheme this large, uh, Southbridge could provide a proper vehicle for that kind of transport on uh, as required basis. The, uh, now, the, the issue about the size of, of the lot and the suitability of it, was that, not, I didn't think that was part of your question, was it? It was not. Okay, so we'll leave that part then. Thank you. Okay. Will Ember, and then Colleen after one. There's a few other things mentioned and sort of expands on the question, so I'd like to address them. Um, first of all, downtown, sadly, uh, is a wonderful heritage district, but it's probably the least accessible buildings that we have in town. And so there might be a net benefit to locating uptown as opposed to downtown. Uh, the area up by the Independent has a lot of amenities uh, like a drugstore and a walk-in clinic and groceries and fast foods and a bank and so on. It's not the boonies. Um, <laughs> and the other thing that was mentioned by um, somebody was the, the question of what to do with the buildings if 65 Ward Street was not used. So Hope Street Terrace and Regency Manor, to my way of thinking, are excellent candidates to become affordable housing, which is something yes. that we desperately need. Thank you. And then Carly. I think looking at any of the other sites, we, we really are not going to be able to see a lot of wonderful things, and our residents will not be able to get to places like Giant Tiger, where they like to go and shop and buy clothes. And um, I'm sorry, but near the Independence, yeah, they've got a Timmy's, but, but that's it. And they, we have residents who walk every day to Tim's. We have residents who shop at Giant Tiger. They want to be able to buy clothes. They want to be able to get out and about. That's not going to happen if the home is placed in an uh, inaccessible area a long way from, from the downtown area in the Lake Shore. Giant Tiger is not downtown. Sorry. Thank you. I think our mayor thing, and I think he, had, he his explanation was excellent. Uh, let's carry on and let's not keep making upwelling this this situation. Let's let's stick to our plan and let's do it and let's uh, address other issues. Moving on to question number 14. Good evening, panel. Sorry, we're turning, we're turning up the mic. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Good. So I live in what my neighbors refer to as the hub, which is on the corner of Shooter and Mill, uh, close to the proximity of the beach, the fishing, all uh, tourist activities come our way. There are all the uh, seniors who live on the top of shooters who have to come down our street to get downtown. Our problem there is traffic. The congested traffic on the corner with people parking on both sides of the street there, a lot of times the, we have a parking lot <coughs> excuse me, right across the street which will be empty. Um, so this is a huge problem, speeding, excessive parking, not enough police coverage, and <clears throat> we have a lot of young children 
riding their bicycles, scooters, the whole nine yards, the seniors, and, <coughs> excuse me, I've been sitting here so long, I'm getting hoarse. And major dog walkers. So I would like to know what the town has in store to try and help our traffic and our streets are really in bad condition. Okay, thank you. Take your card. Yeah. Bless. Thank you. <coughs> One of the uh, things that I want to carry forward for the next uh, four years is making Port Hope a little more pedestrian friendly, and that includes uh, increased uh, enforcement of our traffic uh, speed laws. And the way we're going to do that is we have frozen the uh, police, uh, the size of the police force, at 24 full time officers. Anything we do from now on will be special constables. And they come in about the third of the cost of a uh, regular police person. And they're junior, they do everything except carry a gun. And they'll be trained uh, properly. And they will be a resource to do speed enforcement, etc. So that's one thing how we can get more police on the streets. Uh, the second thing is uh, I, I'd like to see more signage, speed signage, such as the one we have on Jocelyn and the one on Rideout. Uh, in the police budget, we've asked for three more uh, of those signs that we can strategically place, and they're movable, so that's another thing. And then uh, the other thing that Bob alluded to is uh, let's give uh, everybody a fighting chance to get across the street and increase the, uh, the timing on the, uh, the lights so that it's not, okay, start, go, <laughs> are you going to get it? So those are three things I would do. Ian? I think there's also an opportunity to look at some uh, traffic calming measures, particularly on um, key roads. You, there are a few in town, particularly downhill stretches, where there's a long distance between stop signs or traffic lights. If you look at Rideau right down Walton, uh, Pine Street south from Walton down to uh, Augusta, um, you know, there are some innovative uh, traffic calming measures that you can look at that aren't just speed bumps. Um, I think if you look at what's happened on Dorset Street with the you know the big humps and the islands and stuff, like traffic up there is pretty slow, um, you know, sometimes too slow. Um, but uh, but there are ways that we can look at those things as well. And I, I think one of the key parts of that is that council and staff need to know where those areas are. Um, you know, we're we're not out there all the time. Uh, you know, I live on Walton, so I see the cars speeding by, and my three-year-old is running up and down the driveway, and it, it ooh, um, but without people coming forward to address those issues, and I know that that goes for bylaws and parking enforcement and stuff too, if you don't call the bylaw office and say, hey, there's, you know, somebody double parked on my street, then it's hard to enforce those as well. Uh, we can't be vigilant everywhere at all times, um, so, you know, if we can implement more enforcement, uh, coupled with more awareness of where we need to do that enforcement, I think that's going to get a better solution. Great, thanks. And on to Peter now. Yeah, thank you. So I'll have to agree with my colleague. Uh, he's spot on when he's talking about traffic calming. I think this is what I do for a living, folks. I think this would be a great example uh, where traffic calming would really come into play with islands, with vegetation with narrowing the lanes down, with restricting parking and off-street parking and on-street parking. This would be a great example of that. Uh, in fact, Dorset Street, uh, I rebuilt that under my watch, frankly. Um, and so that's a great example where, again, through an environmental assessment process, work with the stakeholders, particularly those that lived on Dorset Street, to implement some sort of um, devices, being the islands or the speed table, that really contributed to positive reductions in speed. Not putting up four-way stops, which I see we've been doing. I've had people comment to me about four-way stops that were put at Sleeman and other places and how it really just encourages driver frustration and they speed up thereafter. And there are some benefits and there are some not some benefits. This I think would be a great example for a traffic calming initiative. I think one of the things we have to keep in mind is the Porto Berry Initiative. And there's a lot of low-level radioactive waste under the ground. And so we don't want to be investing in the surface uh, until the, some of these roads are cleaned up. So I think that's just another aspect of it. There's a lot of roads we put off on doing full reconstruction activities 
uh, um, to, to ensure that we accommodate the PHI or the CNL to clean up the road. So that has to happen first, and, and this particular area uh, could probably use some of that as well. So, But it's, I do certainly agree with my colleague that this would be a great example for traffic on. Bob Sanderson. Um, we've had some talks about being pedestrian friendly or age friendly, we should be pedestrian friendly. And uh, there is a study uh, that was done in Port Hope. It's about five or six years uh, old and it needs to be renewed. Uh, I've had several people, I mean, you're talking about one specific area, and I don't know the area well. Um, I can also tell you there's probably about five or six others that are exactly prime. You know, at the end of Toronto Road, try getting across there from the lakeshore. And one of the things that, that I really think we need to do is have a very strong zero tolerance. Right? Secondly, um, some of the mitigation processes, the signs do have an effect. Um, we also have some signs you don't see that can measure the traffic because perception sometimes is not reality. And then we test something for a week and we say, actually, here's what the average speed is. And then we, we can calibrate it. But one of the things I, I would like to move forward is when you enter town, you know, I think the message needs to be very clear. You know, when you come into a hope, we're pedestrian friendly and we're zero tolerant. And start pushing that and then find the ways to get pedestrians across some of these areas. And the light exchanges are sometimes terrible. Right? They, they really are short when they should be long and long when they should be short. And people don't know if on the Walton Street you press the button, you know, it'll show you your book, and if you don't press the button, you're sitting there wondering what should happen. These are not hard fixes, right? They're what I would call, call small fixes. So I would, you know, very strongly recommend that we get the data. We understand the areas of, of most significant. I've, I've requested that we look at a crosswalk on uh, Peter Street, uh, specifically because Tim Hortons and Giant Tiger are attractive uh, to Lakeland, to the Greenwood uh, Towers, and to uh, CPK. And I see people crossing those four lanes all the time. And there is no place else to cross until you go all the way to Hope or, or you know, Rosecline. That's unacceptable. And when I talk about a crosswalk, I don't mean a red line. I mean a real one, right? Because a red line confuses everyone. Give way to pedestrians, and one side stops, the other one doesn't. And we're very good at confusing our pedestrians, so we're, we're kind of lucky today. But I definitely think that the police are doing a good job. I, I can tell you that they respond quickly. Um, the other thing I would add to it, if you see somebody you know, who's inappropriate, speeding or whatever, take their license number. The police will visit them. You can't give them a ticket or something, but they need to know somebody has said, you're speeding, right? So I'm just letting you know. So we need the public to be uh, totally engaged and supportive of, of such a program. And our entry signs when you come into a community should reflect the kind of community we are. We're children friendly, we're age friendly, and by the way, you don't speed here. We have zero tolerance for that. We've heard of our, uh, many modes of transportation, everything from motorized scooters to via train. There's one little segment, which could be an important segment in the town of Port Hope because of its size and uh, geography, and that's the cycling segment. I'd like to see us be a cycling friendly town as well. Thank you. Like funicular. <laughs> <laughs> Would anybody else like to answer that? We're going to move on to question number 15. Does anybody have question number 15? No, and then he said, never mind. So no one has question 15. Question 16. Question 17. In order to keep Port Hope as a family town, not just for tanneries and commuters, we need jobs. What should Port Hope do to get more jobs here? I don't want to harp on something that we've talked about a lot already, but we need affordable housing. We can't attract young families here if they can't afford to live here. Um, you know, our business park is spoken for, but who's going to work in those jobs? So to get more jobs and more young people moving here, we need somewhere for them to live affordably. Yeah. Uh, Wilf, we're, we're 
we're doing a good job at it, actually. Uh, CPK added, uh, I think, uh, 89 jobs. Uh, Trade Tech has added over 20 jobs. <coughs> the business park will add jobs. The hotel will add jobs. And they're all coming, and I, I agree. You know, we need to find the, the labor force for them. So I'm not sure we have a, uh, a job problem. The manufacturers group would tell you that the average uh, employee that they have is over 50 years old. And they're worried about succession. So these are the, the bigger employers as well. So we really do need to look after what we have and also you know, uh, allow for expansion. But what, I think we're, we're doing a great job of creating jobs. Right? And I think the next part that uh, I do have some worry about, um, and I'll just throw this out there, but our, our education system in Port Hope is starting to uh, be at risk. Right? So yes. our high school is now combined with our public school. Uh, they still have empty spaces. The programs are diminishing and nobody's paying attention, right? The school board, um, and I'm, I'm trying to arrange a uh, meeting with uh, Jennifer Leclerc, um, because I think the school board sometimes uh, isn't very far reaching in their approach. Um, we're looking at an aging community, but I'm telling you right now, we have a whole bunch of young people moving to this community. We're seeing them, you know, because that, that's a natural progress. I go up King Street, that used to be, you know, all old people, there's children playing now. If you go into some of the other areas, so I, I challenge the fact that we are stagnating as as being you know an older community, and I'm certainly there. But the reality is, it starts to cycle and begets younger people, uh, and they are moving here. Our children are moving back. They need the housing, you know. And affordable is if you're eighty thousand dollars and you can't get a place to live, you don't have affordable housing. So we are doing, I think, a good job, you know, in, in creating employment. Uh, we need to make sure we retain the employment. We need to work with the people who are already here as employers and make sure they you know, have the opportunity to keep their employees and get them back. And one of the things I suggested to them, they need talented you know, employment. They're not going to the colleges. So you go to the college and you say, why don't you come here? And they go, well, there's no jobs. And you go to the manufacturer and they go, we need employees. So somebody's got to you know, get that together. But I, I do, you know, strike a chord that uh, we need to pay attention to our high school. Uh, I've talked to um, some representatives from the military. One of the suggestions that has come up is you know, having a cadet program at the high school because students now can go where they want and if they continue to have a poor choice of, of uh, you know, classes and, and educational opportunities at, at Port Hope, that's going down, right? And it might go down and then be totally you know, needing uh, a replacement. So I think we need to be fairly broad in our, our approach and, and not just you know, look at jobs or employment. This is a package, right? And, and if we can't say the garbage problem is the counties, the social problem is the counties. The housing you know, problem that we talk about, there's a national housing strategy. The county has a housing strategy. We've done workshops with them. We have tools. You know, so certainly my recommendation is that we, we join you know, that program. We become advocates for ourselves. We do not leave anything to the first tier of, of government. And we do not put our hand out and make requests. Sometimes we make demands, and the demand I think we need to make now, and when I talk to General Gilbert, I'll find out hopefully what will happen or what their plans are, because they'll be five years ahead and then five years behind at the same time. We don't we can't find out what St. Mary's is doing. There's a big empty building sitting there. You know, and we get no response. So I talked to um, David Piccini. You know, I said you need to weigh in here. So we can find out what's happening here. So, well, I probably wandered from the job thing a bit because I think we're fine on the jobs. I'm not sure we're fine around the jobs. So, thanks for the question. Thank you. And then Miles. Um, Long-term care is also struggling, not just in Port Hope, but in Ontario, in Canada. We cannot find nurses. Um, you know, we need to be encouraging the colleges. The college, uh, Fleming, uh, canceled uh, the uh, personal support worker program because there's no one out there um, who is coming forward to take it. We need to get involved with the high school um, and encourage students to start taking courses that will lead them either into a personal support worker, um, a nursing, uh, career, 
we need these people in our in our town and um, there's lots of jobs and I have to say my home alone has more than 20 staff that have 40 years in they're going to be retiring very soon and we're going to need a lot of people to work in our home and then miles thanks um, so uh, one of the things that I think that we need to do is think laterally about job creation. Uh, so what are the, the circumstances that we are creating in towns, for example, through our cultural events that can increase the uh, money going into pockets of local businesses? Uh, currently, it's difficult for uh, home business owners to basically like put up a one-stop shop at, say, Fill Your Fanny or at the farmer's market, etc., because there's a prohibitive cost to the, the business license. Uh, so I think that we need to look at uh, how, how can we make it uh, more affordable for the people that run their side hustle, the business on the side, uh, to, to basically make uh, money. Uh, and, and, uh, and I think we can also structure some of our cultural festivals so that they have a component of like the, the setup, a uh, sidewalk sale, that sort of thing. So if you think about the way that Cultivate has been operating, uh, over the last two years they've put on the, the outdoor market. I think that we can uh, do a little bit more of that at some of our outdoor festivals that also make it so that there's viable business opportunity for those people that run their side hustle. That also allows them to, to stay around. Uh, number two, uh, I'm from an academic institution. We need to start thinking about ways that we can market uh, Port Hope to those academic institutions so that they think a little bit more about uh, what they can be doing for the development of the community. So. When I uh, was teaching both at Trent and UOIT, I would talk to the very few students from Northumberland, and they all talked about how there was no job opportunity for them. That means that uh, as the council, we need to start thinking creatively about how we can be going to those institutions and saying things like, hey, we've got the opportunity coming up. Uh, we want to be moving forward with long-term care that expands and offers even more jobs in the future. We want to have a conversation with you about bringing in young people that are training. We also want to be talking with like engineering programs where we can set up little display things. Uh, an example that's been floated earlier was basically having like model small houses put up that we would coordinate with some of the local universities so that they could do basically like small projects and show some cutting edge technology. All of this could benefit the uh, concept of young people as to Port Hope being a future home for them. And it also shows that we're interested in growing those spaces for young people to put down roots and contribute taxes over the long run. We also have a couple of um, exciting potential new uh, college programs coming to town. Um, that are specifically related to things that we're really good at here, like food, like agriculture, like nuclear science. Um, there was another one and I forgot what it was. Darn. Um, Historic preservation, when he said, you know, um, we, but we need to be looking at, at ways like that. And going back to Miles's point and, and, and the point about long-term care, you know, that's something that we're going to need here for a long time, and we have a lot of, you know, facilities that do that kind of thing. So we should be actively going out to those colleges and saying, hey, put a program here because that will help us either keep or attract our sort of, you know, post-secondary age people, and then hopefully they stay here once they're done school. Um, so looking at those opportunities for how do we educate people in things that our community is really good at and then keep them here, I think is another um, way that we can look at building more jobs in those areas that we excel at. Great, thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on to question number 18. Oh. <laughs> run, Forrest, run. <clears throat> Drama, drama here at the end. I'm, I'm Rod Stewart, and I'm in Ward 1. You can also just take it out of the stand. Oh, yeah. Sorry, yeah, thank you. Uh, given that in the last term of council, a councillor was removed from office for inappropriate behaviour in the workplace, what do you intend to do to accomplish a policy that will deal with this issue? <laughs> okay, so I wasn't looking. Who was first? 
paying less, less, less. Less than Terry than less? Well, we do have policies in place. Uh, they need to be followed. Uh, they need to be enacted upon when uh, things fall off the rails. Council has to get out of the way. Uh, it's not a council problem when one of these issues comes up. We gotta turn it over to the professionals, uh, in, in all fairness to the, uh, the victim and to the accused. Um, so uh, we gotta get it out of our hands a lot quicker and move the, move the process along that way. In my opinion. <coughs> Hi, I have experience in this. Uh, so one of the things that I did at the university that I'm from was developing a sexual violence policy. So I think that there's a number of things that we could do uh, that specifically address this. First and foremost, we need to make public pronouncements that sexual violence is not tolerated in our community. We need to be very loud about that. And we need to make it clear that women's voices matter. We believe that. This is important because part of the general structure of better policy uh, construction is separating the complaint process from the help process. So we need to connect the community with easy to find resources that make it okay for help seeking and that are publicly available on the web, etc. So it's really easy to do. You just put that information out there and we talk about it a lot. Uh, I think just waiting for something bad to happen is a misstep. We need to talk about being forward on this and how we're welcoming of different voices and looking for ways to get them involved. A, a real world example of that is, for example, looking for community construction, sorry, uh, committee construction, and whether all the committees have uh, women as part of them. That's a simple step, but that doesn't go far enough. If you're the chair of the committee, you make sure that the women are speaking at every meeting, because often uh, they will be silenced through some sort of systemic problem where their voices don't matter or they're overlooked or other people take their their uh, ideas and make it look like they're their own. So if you're a chair, there's simple things that you can do where you echo things that women are saying and you make sure that their voices are part of an active contribution in the community. Gosh. I have a lot to say about this. What I would say is we have a corner to turn in the community, and I think we have a really great opportunity to put something out there that says that help is available. It's part of a larger mental health strategy, and it's part of a healthy conversation that I think we need to be having in our community. And then we get to the policy part where we say, if you want, because this is the other truth of the matter, most individuals that go through sexual violence don't want to go through the punitive uh, route. And the reason is because they've seen Gian Gomeshi and what he got away with. So what we need to do is make it clear that help is available and we can help you with that. That's part of our healthy community. And if you want, we can help you with that punitive route. But that's not the only way that the community can help you. Thank you. Wow. Without getting windy, can we teach respect within the family? Yeah. Yeah. Period. It starts there and not make it any more complicated than we seem to be doing. Respect. Terry. Thank you. I'm going to go back a little bit to what Les was talking about. But one of the other things is when a new council comes into place, one of the very first things is kind of the rules of how you do anything. And one of the things that has to happen is you, each council has to have a code of conduct. And that has to be very well explained. But just aside from this issue, there's a lot of other issues that come into place in terms of code of conduct. We really have to make it very clear that certain kinds of behavior, whether they're related to sexual natures or just bad behavior or a sense of lack of respect, all of those things have to be addressed so that every council member understands what the rules are and understands how they should be conducting themselves. And that should be one of the very first things that happens with the new council. Thanks for that, Peter. I would simply want to say miles well for Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and you know, quite honestly, that was the goal of this tonight was to see where you all disagree and where you do agree. And, that, and it's nice to see that. Thank you. Go ahead, Miles. 
<laughs> Guess what, I have more to say. Um, just having a policy in place is, is great, and I, I agree with the code of conduct, but part of what Terry is just uh, pinging for me that I want everyone paying attention to is it, it matters more that the, the people that are in uh, the, the council are actively looking for ways to create space uh, for everyone's voices. That means that it's not waiting for the policy to do the work. If you see someone misbehaving, my expectation and what I'm going to bring is that I'm going to stand up against that. You've kind of seen some of that already on the campaign trail. Uh, and so uh, I, I would call on the rest of us to, to look for ways that beyond the policy, our code of conduct is something that we're expecting and upholding uh, or, or enforcing to each other. We're not waiting for a complaint process. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Can somebody help Anthony with the microphone? No, sorry. Okay. Very simply, more women on council. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Means more candidates. Great, thank you. Does anybody else have anything to say? Great, we're going to move on. Yeah. Oh, Ron, are you, are you I on? I have another 8 oh. We have two 18s. 18 B. 18 B, yeah. Do yeah. <laughs> Hello, my name is Jordan Appleman. I'm from the great city of Welcome. Uh, my question is, since today is World Mental Health Day, what will you do to make sure that everyone in our community gets the mental health care that they need? Any, anyone? Anyone? <laughs> Hi, Jordan, uh, and I think that's amazing that uh, these two are the same 18, because uh, a big part of dealing with mental health is having a comprehensive strategy that uh, basically has, starts that conversation with the community, that health seeking is okay, and that resources are out there. So I would like to see us much more deliberately uh, publishing and putting the materials out there that uh, there are resources in the community, and we can start to identify where, for example, there are deficits in our ability to provide aid to people, irrespective of sexual violence just across the whole mental uh, health spectrum. I think we also want to uh, actively have a conversation with people that mental health is more than uh, what we think of in terms of people being institutionalized. Uh, being mentally healthy is doing things like, for example, combating stress. Uh, and, and so I think when I talked about uh, my role on Parks and Rec, that's one of the things that I want, want to bring in, is active lifestyle uh, into that portfolio and look at ways that outdoor spaces can build mental health, uh, uh, inoculation, if you will, and, and that sort of a thing. So I think that there's places in it, and, and uh, I think there's basically like already opportunity in the things that we do to really magnify this as something that we put out there to the community. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So this is a subject close to my heart. I started my career some 40 years ago in mental health and, uh, and did become a psychiatric nurse. I support CAMH. I also believe that it starts with education and it starts with acceptance and it starts with respect for everyone. Um, not centering people out. There are so many people that are hiding mental health issues in our community, in every community. And we have to be open to support, but we also have to educate everyone, starting with young children. They have to understand that, you know, this happens, it's just a different part of the body that is in need of uh, health. And uh, we need to make sure that we're getting that word out there and making sure that um, the resources are there and that our support staff, uh, the police, the ambulance, you know, know how to work with people who have mental health issues. Because the bottom line is, if I have a mental health issue and I don't want help, you can't force it on me unless 
I am doing something that literally puts my life or someone else's life in danger within 24 hours. So it's a, it's a big problem and we have to make it acceptable to be able to have uh, health issues and be able to deal with them and uh, not ostracize people that do have these issues because it has always been a hidden issue for so many years and you know um, we have to open our doors and support these people. Brian, were you? Brian Huggins. Um, one of the areas in mental health is in, starts in the home. Um, it's important that parents remember to uh, teach their children a lot of the things that they're going to face in life. Um, I see today too many children spending all of their non-school time, and my, I have two grandchildren that fall into this category. Would you like yeah. me to repeat the question? I'm, I'm coming back to mental health. Okay. Um, there, we're not teaching our children how to properly uh, develop their mental health. I see it uh, from coaching in uh, sports. I see it from officiating in sports. Um, there are many factors in mental health, and it's not just uh, what we see on the street. There is an awful lot of behind-the-scenes mental health that needs to be dealt with. And I'll go back to last night uh, at the All Candidates meeting. We need to develop strategy or listings of services and businesses and uh, individuals that are available to deal with these particular issues. Um, because without the li many of us don't know who can deal with mental health. I think that's a, you know. Uh, my late wife was a, was a nurse and told me many things that uh, she had to deal with from a mental health aspect. Um, but we don't have the available uh, or listings that we can direct people to. We're guessing in a lot of cases. Uh, so uh, Colleen talking about the invisibility of mental health just uh, reminded me of another thing, which is, uh, what I'd like to see in terms of what the town does and, and its service uh, approach is to provide all of the employees with mental health first aid. So uh, it's frequently the case that uh, uh, people who are working in public spaces have uh, first aid training, but mental health first aid is, is a thing that's available as well. That can teach people who are acting on behalf of the town what signs to recognize to make those things that uh, otherwise would seem invisible very obvious to you. And then your approach can go back to uh, rather than feeling paralyzed and thinking that you can't offer help, always offering help first. They may not take it on that first go, but if that message gets out there that help is available, help is available, help is available, you're much more likely to have somebody finally listen. Thank you. I think, you, did you yeah. say, yep, 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 thank you. One of the challenges we have with help is available and finding people to help you is that we don't always have those people easily accessible in town. Uh, if you talk to a number of the people who work with Greenwood Coalition, you know they're, they're having to go to Coburg for their services. Um, so we need to be looking at how the town can provide a space for you know, a practitioner from Coburg to come over once a week and spend time here in our town to help our citizens. We need to be looking at family physician recruitment. You know, that's why I'm here. My wife's a family doctor. We were recruited to be here in Port Hope, uh, but we don't have enough physicians. Uh, we need to be looking at you know, other healthcare professionals as well. How do we get them here? Because that's one of the problems we have. It, we, we certainly need to make that help available, but we need to make sure that that help is here in the first place. Thank you. All kinds of great stuff mentioned here. I think one thing that hasn't really been mentioned clearly is homelessness. And so that takes us back to the uh, affordable housing problem that we have in this town that we need to get on and do something about right away. In terms of homelessness, 
I just want to point out we need to not try to reinvent the wheel or come up with something brand new. We simply need to go to the organizations that already work with the homeless people in this community, like the Greenwood Coalition, and we need to ask them, what do you need? How can we help? It's not about coming up with a plan of our own. Thank you for bringing that up, Will. This was a question I was asked last night, and you know, how will we deal with homelessness? And I think we also have to look at the greater, you know, there are a lot of towns that are our size that are doing other things. And, and um, you, how many buildings do we have vacant in this town? Um, Would you like me to repeat the question? Yes, please, thank you. So the, the gist of the question is, what will you do to make sure everyone in our community gets the mental health care that they need? Okay. One of the ways is to make sure that they have a home, and those who are homeless definitely need support. We have vacant buildings in town that could be created to provide safe family um, areas, uh, also support for single men. We need to look at this. We need to look at what other co communities have done and absolutely use the people who have expertise in our community. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna move on to question 19 and maybe our last question. 20? 21. 22. Does anyone have a question? Does anyone have a question left? We have one question. Wait. Wait why, don't, why don't we take this question here from just to the mic? Okay. Uh, we need workers, and we need low-cost housing. Should we be actively attracting immigrants? I think that's a win-win situation. I think that looks like a yes. Yes, for everybody. As, a, as an immigrant myself. Um, anybody else? <laughs> <laughs> we we all said yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so the Civic Awards Committee has had several struggles over the past couple of years. Um, including having our council rep removed because it appeared that um, he wasn't taking our concerns and representing us to council properly. Thankfully, that has been corrected. Um, however, it did at that time make things very difficult. So, my question is, what do you see for the future of this program that honors volunteers and what will, will that include major change into how the Civic Awards Committee and the awards night is run? Les? <laughs> yes, there will be changes to the, uh, the way it is run. Um, unfortunately, I missed your meeting where you discussed this with uh, our uh, with Jeannie. And um, uh, we are waiting for a comeback from the Civic Awards uh, Committee, specifically what items uh, irked you, because we know there was a couple. And let's get them out on the table and we'll discuss them. Um, but we, we would like to move forward with a slightly different agenda. Could you explain what that means? No, <laughs> I can't, because I'm waiting for you to come back to me. Well, thank you. Um, my only answer would be that I'd like to see uh, expansion of the program. I think Civic Awards is a great thing. Um, we have to take care of our volunteers in this community. As somebody who ran a couple of organizations in this town that made extensive use of volunteers, they were our bread and butter. They did all the work for no pay, and we treated them like gold. We actively told them on a daily basis how wonderful they were. And the Civic Awards Committee does the same thing for this community. The town does put on a dinner for town committee uh, workers and representatives, but the Civic Awards is the only thing available for the greater volunteers that aren't involved in a national town committee. So yeah, I'd like to see the program expanded, and uh, you do good work. Miles. 
Um, I was fortunate to go to that award ceremony uh, this year. It was rockin'. Uh, it was a, a really fantastic community building affair, and it's one that uh, I would like to see uh, beyond just that evening. So uh, I've spoken a little bit about uh, people-led initiatives, and I think that this is a really great version of that. Um, when I look at uh, things like the, the Port Hope website, I'm not seeing enough of the who. Uh, and, and we talk, I mean, everyone here has talked about how our favorite thing is the people, and those people aren't being highlighted as the thing that makes Port Hope when you go to that website. So even just like little introductions like stars of Port Hope that are like on that front page so that we get to brag about these amazing people and the contributions that they're making to the community uh, or, or just like publishing that in other ways. Because I've seen that uh, on Facebook, uh, for example, but I think that it should be part of the municipality's approach is to like honoring them. Um, this, this is probably one of the most important programs we have and that we enjoy. And we have invested in it more, and um, some of you participated in it, and it, it also becomes fun. Um, one of the things I think we struggle with as, as council you know, is, is how do you, you know, uh, acknowledge and recognize you know, some of the levels? You know, and how do you get the submissions from people to acknowledge and recognize some of these people? Some of them don't want to be recognized, and some of them are doing so much work you know, that we, we, and it takes a little bit of an effort, you know, to, to be an advocate and bring somebody's name forward. And when we go through some of the changes, you know, the fact of the matter is, you know, the, we have a lot of categories, we probably don't have enough names submitted. So if we can actively promote this as being an important program, and I like some of the concepts about, you know, elevating, you know, the reasons for this, telling the stories you know, some of them have got stories. We go down to the beaches and we see the same people picking up paper all the time. And I've never seen them once out of the world. Right? But somebody will picking up a couple piece of paper saying, hey, hello, look at what I did, gets an award. So that's what I think we're struggling with, you know, when we uh, try to make it legitimate and recognize and make it fun at the same time. And, and we've talked uh, sort of internally, you know, how can we support this? It's not just budget. Um, some awards need to be more prestigious. Right, and then we need to maybe you know, acknowledge that in, in a different way. You know, and, and maybe it's separate, even at council recognitions or whatever. But certainly, I've, I've seen over the last, because we came very close as a council to saying, you know, nobody really is interested in this. The Capitol Theater has you know, 25 people in, 25 people got awards, and as soon as they got there, where they left. And now, it is fun. You know, and, and there's being you know, injected into it that it's fun to come to the awards and recognize them. <coughs> But I'm not sure we're building the stories of these people well enough, right? or that there's significant follow-up that there should be recognition. So two or three things I, I would like to see. I'd like to see the process of nomination be uh, friendly, you know, so that people can not have to do a lot of work to testify everything. I'd like to see some sort of auditing process you know, on, on it, so that the, the committee really is reviewing it. I'd like to see the committee itself follow rules with respect to you know, can you, who you, can you nominate, how can you nominate, and so the committee isn't, you know, incestuous, so to speak. And then, really, if we recognize, we've done it with our staff, we've done it with the firefighters, you know, somebody mentioned, well, we have a dinner. It used to be a cheap dinner, <laughs> you know, we wanted to come. Now we have a better dinner, you know, and if you recognize a lot of people who are helping, at least feed them well. <laughs> so our budget for recognition has gone up. Um, I think the Civic Awards, as I said, is, is probably the one of the most significant things we can do. We can't run without volunteers. But it does need to be reviewed. I would like to see a lot of engagement in that review process, so council doesn't have to do it. I, we don't want to be the ones who dictate to it. We'd certainly like to be able to say what we support, how we support it, and recognize the importance. You know, and I, I think we're not there yet. I think the last couple of years have been a lot better, but uh, there's work to be done, and I think from Les's perspective and the work he's uh, recently done, we're, we're trying to get that feedback now and, and we're going to continue to build and promote this. Okay, thank you. So it's five after time. Um, so if you want to keep going, I'm sure we can go for a few more minutes. No. <laughs> the, the community says no. So let's hear it for the candidates who came out. safely and uh, if you care to if you care to toss a couple
couple dollars in the red bucket will help pay for the night. Thank you again to David for videoing. The video will be up tomorrow. And Michelle for uh, helping us out here tonight. She runs the Lions Ball. She did well. so Thank you, everybody. Thank you to the organizers. Just so you know, too, this will also be available as a podcast on nothingexistradio.org.